Good morning and welcome to worship today. Special day as we celebrate the graduates among us. It's not a nice day outside, but I'm reminded, how, thinking about how fitting it is for what we're talking about today, um, that there's a lot of times in life where it's sunny and there's a lot of times in life where it's not. And we have to learn how to walk faithfully in all of them. So it's a good, good reminder as we look forward to sun and get drizzly cold weather instead. Um, today, we're not going to have a greeting time. We're going to be watching a video here in just a minute and honoring our graduates. But if you remember to pass the, uh, the Red Books in, um, you can pass in any prayer requests or anything like that at this time in those. Um, also, just as a reminder to periodically re remind everyone, so we don't pass an offering plate here. I know for many of us that's familiar. Um, it feels a new thing to me coming here. Um, there are offering plates around, or you can give online if that's more of your style. There's directions on how to do that in the bulletin. But now we're going to go ahead and watch a video just to look at our graduates for a minute. But he brought me in all his love for me, all his love for me. Who the song sets free, who oh, is free indeed, I'm a child. A slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died.
if uh, the graduates you could stand and, and process down to the front, just briefly. I want to recognize you and give you a gift on behalf of the church. So just congratulations on passing this first major milestone in your life that will define much of your lives to come. So Annie and let's see, this would be Blake and Brooke and Jude. Um, so here's our, our graduates and just uh, can go ahead and you can clap. Yeah. <laughs> And just as a, a prayer of blessing over you as, as you go, some staying, some going, but as you go in, in life that, that you will have curiosity to try new things, that you will have humility to accept that there are many things that have already been figured out that you don't need to change, and that you will have the faith to find and cling to Jesus in a world where everything seems like it's changing. So thank you, here's our, our graduates. We continue our service with our entrance hymn. Please stand and sing with me number 177, Wonderful World's Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, Christ the blessed in one to all. Wonderful words of life, sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life sweetly echo the gospel call wonderful words of life offer pardon and peace to all wonderful words of life jesus only savior sanctify forever beautiful words wonderful words Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Please remain standing for the invocation. Let us pray. God, sometimes we gather for worship with hearts set to praise you, hearts full of joy at the rich goodness we are blessed with in this world. Sometimes we gather for worship with hearts uncertain about praise, hearts weighed down with the burdens and pains which we find in this world. Wherever our hearts are today, teach us anew to sing our praises to you, whether that shouts of joy or whispers of pain. Lead us today in Jesus, your son, the man of sorrows, the great comforter of souls, and the king of glory. Amen.
The first scripture reading is Ruth 1, 19 through 22, and can be found on page 412 of the Pew Bible. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, can this, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Offertory prayer, let us pray. Almighty God, you are the source of every blessing. You are the giver of life and love. Accept this offering as a token of our thanksgiving for all that you have done for us, most especially in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. May what we give today and how we live this life help in the fulfillment of your good purpose of love and life everlasting for all people. In Jesus' name, amen. The second reading is Romans 11, 33 through 36, and can be found on page 1,763 of the Pew Bible. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for, all, and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. There are many interesting, exciting, and even puzzling parts of J.R.R. Tolkien's now famous trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. Um, there was a recent adaptation, kind of recent, it's getting kind of old now, but the movies um, has introduced the world again to the wonderful fantasy land of Middle Earth. And in the last movie, called The Return of the King, some, uh, a lot of criticism is directed towards the director, Peter Jackson, because it seems like the movie ends six different times, if you've ever seen it. And it seems like it just goes on and on and on. Okay, well, what Peter Jackson, the director, is struggling with is that the high point of the action in The Lord of the Rings, the high point to end on would be right after the Ring of Power is destroyed, Sauron is defeated, and good triumphs. The king has his kingdom, and it's established again. That would be the, that's the high point, the climax of the action. But that's not where the story ends. And to end there is actually to miss part of the most important message that Tolkien has in his story. So the, the story doesn't end at the high point of the powerful and successful victory. The story ends where it began, back in Little Hobbiton with just the normal people going about their normal life. And one of the deepest points in Tolkien's fantasy world, Middle Earth, is that those who go out on a quest come back changed. It's one of the deepest points. There's no way to engage with the quest and not be changed by it. The journey changes the journeyer. And that's really key. So Frodo the Hobbit may have succeeded in destroying the Ring of Power and saving the Shire and really all of Middle Earth, but it ends back in normal life. And we find out that the journey has so changed Frodo, there's no longer peace for him. He's been marred and he's broken by the struggles of the world. 
And that's really where the, uh, the story ends. They went there and they came back again, but everyone has changed. And now they have to figure out what does life look like now that we're not who we used to be. And as we uh, look through the book of Ruth, chapter one, this is really what we've, uh, what we've seen sketched across this chapter. The theme of coming back, but coming back different. Chapter one traces the journey of Naomi first out of Bethlehem with her family to escape a famine and they go to Moab and get food. And eventually some 10 plus years later, they come back. Really, she comes back because in the meantime, her husband and both her sons have died. And so she comes back empty, broken by the trials of life. And when she does come back with Ruth in tow, Naomi is the talk of the town. People are excited to see her again. And in keeping with the focus on women and women's perspective in this book, the narrator makes a point to say it's the women of the city who are in a stir at Naomi comes back and they're like, is this Naomi? And there's kind of two things going on in their response to her. One is like, Wow, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you again. Okay, so it's been 10 years since she left. Now in a world without social media or easy travel, someone could live a town over and you would never see them again in the rest of your life. And just imagine if we had to walk to Gulliver. You suddenly it's not that attractive to go there regularly, okay? So if someone moves away and you just don't see them again because it takes a long time to get anywhere. So they're excited. The other part, though, is, oh, man, is this what you look like now? Life has not been kind to you. So here's Naomi coming back. And her, her life has been hard. And she's not happy to be back. She went there. She's come back again. But it's not because she, she's happy about the journey. But just keep in mind that through this whole interchange, as the women of the town are, are talking to Naomi, Ruth is just standing there in the wings, and no one acknowledges her. Naomi doesn't introduce her. No one talks to her. It's all just Naomi and the, the town's women talking to one another. Ruth has declared her intention to enter into God's people, to be in Naomi's family for good. And yet there doesn't seem to be an obvious place for her to fit yet. No one seems to know what to do with her. And much of the rest of the book of Ruth is dealing with this question, one form or another of, can this outsider be redeemed into God's people or not? And so at this point in the story, communal excitement is going on. Naomi's back. Ruth is kind of standing over there. Naomi launches into what is one of the richest, deepest, and most troubling parts of the whole book of Ruth. And it's rich and difficult because it's really near to our experience. Bitterness in life. Verses 20 and 21, after the crowd assembles and is like, yeah, Naomi's back. And Naomi looks at them, and, and she makes it clear that being back is not a happy thing for her. She takes it upon herself to rename herself. And the name she picks is Mara, which means bitter. So there's a pattern throughout the Old Testament of giving names in response to how God works in the lives of the people. And so Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter, it's entirely consistent with this pattern. She names herself bitter, and the reason she gives is this. The Almighty has made me exceedingly bitter. So call me bitter. Now in a minute, we're going to go and, and think about Naomi's ascription of her bitterness to God. I'll have to come back to that and, and wrestle with it. But in effect, at this point, she's saying, the life which God has dealt me is a bitter one, so call me bitter. 
not Naomi. And so us, Naomi is just a name, but in, in Hebrew, Naomi means something like pleasant one. Okay, so change me from pleasant, because that doesn't fit my life anymore. I'm bitter. That's who I am. She's not in a happy place. And I think it's significant that in her, unha in her unhappiness, she's actually got a warped perspective about what's going on. She says, God brought me out full and has brought me back empty. That's not true. Because standing right over there is Ruth. She's not actually alone. She's not actually empty. Yes, her husband and her sons are dead, but she's not alone. But in her bitterness, she's accounting Ruth as nothing at this moment. And how like God and the way he works that it's going to be through this young woman, Ruth, that Naomi will find hope, joy, and redemption again. And at the end, these same women who are excited about Naomi's return are going to say, Ruth is better than seven sons to you. But at this moment in the story, that's all unknown and in the future. At this moment in her life, Naomi looks at her life and says, my life is not good. My life is bitter. Who can relate to Naomi at this point? Who can relate? Well, she may, as, may have suffered greater losses than many of us, and maybe even lesser losses than some of us, we've all experienced in one way or another the bitterness of life. And we're all going to experience more of it. Maybe a season of life where a loved one died or a job turns ugly or your financial situation crashes or a relationship ends or an injury drains the joy out of your life or you lose the abilities to do things that are meaningful to you and you used to do. We can all identify to one degree or another with Naomi here. My life has become bitter, so call me bitter. What can we do, what should we do in those bitter moments of life? in the bitter periods that we live in, that we walk through. And I think Naomi is, is a helpful example here among others in just helping us understand it's not wrong to be upset about the hard things in life. To be saddened by life is not wrong. To be at a loss for why things are the way they are in life is not wrong. You think of the psalmists and how often the cry of the psalmists is, God, to paraphrase God, my life is awful right now, and I will trust you. I don't understand what's going on. This is terrible, but you're still God. That's a, a repeated cry throughout the scriptures. God is okay with us coming to him and saying, God, I don't understand, and I don't like it. That's okay. Another thing to keep in mind as, as we work through the bitterness of life, and which will be proven in Naomi's case, is to stay with the people who care for you, who care about you. And how often it turns out to be the case that our, our journey back into hope is carried along by the people in our lives who care for us. And so while bitterness brings with it the temptation to withdraw away and to close down in our pain and to just cut ourselves off, well, what we really need is the people who love us to be around us and to walk with them. And interestingly, look for ways to love other people, even in the midst of our bitterness and pain. Naomi finds her return to hope when she changes and starts asking, what can I do to help Ruth? 
my life is bitter, how can I help Ruth? Starts looking at how to help other people. And a, a pastor acquaintance of mine shared when he lost his wife very young, much sooner than expected. And in, in the season of pain following that, the question became for him every morning to pray, God, show me some way I can do right today. I don't like my life right now. I'm sad and it's broken. How can I help somebody else today? And that became a lifeline for him in the time of bitterness, of learning, you know, even in the brokenness, we can still love and care for others. And in many ways, that helps us come out of and through bitterness. But under, under all of these, what we see in Naomi is that even in the bitterness, stay faithful to God, even when we don't understand, even when we're not sure what's going on. So Naomi is, is a great example here. While she's bitter, she returns to the land. She says, I'm still with you, God. While she doesn't understand and doesn't like what's going on, she continues to understand everything as under God's control and in God's hands which will point us to the bigger question that we'll come back to in, in a few minutes of how can God be good and there be so much awful things in our lives? And that's, that's more specific than the generic how can God be good and there be bad things? But you know, how can there be bad things in our lives when we are walking and trying to be faithful to God? And we'll, we'll return to that question. It's an important question, and it's one that's forced upon us as we read this story. But first, I want us to also think about what we can do for other people as they wrestle with bitterness in their lives. Because again, Ruth is here in this whole scene, nameless, speechless, but she's there. She's with Naomi. No one acknowledges her, but she's there. When the hubbub of Naomi's return has died down, the other women go back to their normal lives, and Ruth is still there, still with her. She walks with Naomi through the entire journey of despair and the return to joy and hope. And for much of that journey, it seems basically as though Ruth throws Naomi upon her back and carries her through it. She holds everything together while Naomi is lost in bitterness. And we're told to bear one another's burdens, and it's difficult to think of a better example of that than Ruth. Ruth, who walks faithfully with Naomi. She's there. She's not doing anything spectacular. She's not a grief counselor. She's not a psychologist. She's not a religious leader. In fact, as a, as a new member of the community and a new worshiper of Yahweh, the God of Israel, we don't really expect that much out of her in terms of showing profound understanding of who God is and how God cares for his people. And yet that's exactly what we see in Ruth is a profound example of how God, the tender one, walks with his people in the midst of their pain. And that is what we see in Ruth. She's present and she helps out. Now, of course, there's certainly a place and a time for people like counselors and for people like psychologists and certainly for religious leaders and, and talking to pastors in times of grief. God can and often uses such people to give us new insight as we refine hope in life. And, and yet most of the actual working out of walking from despair and bitterness back into hope is accompanied by people like Ruth. Normal people who are with us, who care for us, who are virtuous and good people, and who just walk alongside in the darkness. God can and does do great works of redemption through your willingness to just be there in the bitterness of someone else's life. 
soul surgery of the highest order can be carried out by normal, faithful living as we see other people in bitterness and just continue to love them, continue to walk through life with them and to bear burdens as best as we are able. One of our greatest opportunities to demonstrate the heart of God is to live with the love and compassion of Jesus Christ towards other people who are in the bitterness of life. Joy is a very fragile thing. It's also a very resilient thing. Joy can be cut and destroyed, but joy can also be found in new ways in life. And a big part of what we as God's people have the opportunity to do when we see others in bitterness is to serve as a connection between them and the heart of God. As a channel of God's love and just a reminder, a faithful, steady presence, you are cared. Yes, life is hard. Yes, this is not fun. You are cared for. And here I am as God's loving presence in your life to help you in any way I can. Scripture says that people will know the followers of Jesus by their love. And this, this faithful love in the midst of bitterness is one of the great testimonies that we can give to other people of a hope of redemption that exists. I just, I just note and think about this. So Naomi renames herself Mara despair, sorry, not despair, bitterness, bitter. She renames herself bitter. But nowhere in the book of Ruth is she ever called Mara. It doesn't happen. And later on in chapter four, we'll read about Ruth's son, Obed. And according to the laws and customs, which we'll talk about later, he theoretically is in the genealogy of Ruth's dead husband. So it's weird, but we'll get there. But he's actually counted in the genealogy of Boaz, his actual biological father. So two times in this short book, we have interesting things going on with names. Obed, who should be counted in one line, is counted in another. Naomi, who calls herself bitter, is never called bitter by anyone else through the remainder of the story. And I think there's a subtle hint there a subtle message of hope, a hope of redemption. See, bitterness is not the final word in Naomi's story. And bitterness need not be the final word in your story or in the story of other people who we know and interact with. There is redemption. There is a hope that something greater than the bitterness can happen. God redeems people in the midst of pain, in the midst of bitterness, in the midst of hopelessness. And the way he does that is by joining us in it, not necessarily removing us from it, but joining us in it. Jesus Christ joined our lives joined our pain, joined our hopelessness and despair and bitterness. The cross of Jesus is God's ultimate pledge of the depths of his love and desire to redeem us out of the bitterness of life. So as you think about your life, what are those areas in your life where you're tempted to say, name me bitter because my life is bitter. What tempts you to believe that God is against you rather than for you? And I, I invite you to think about those areas and to consider them fully because God aims to bring redemption into the depths of our bitterness, into the depths of our brokenness, and our despair. 
Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is able to meet us in the bitterness of life and bring hope and bring light if we want him to. And that's a great promise and hope that we have. So if that's the great hope that we have, that God is able to bring redemption and light even into the most bitter aspects of life, we still have to return to this question that Naomi forces us to think about. Who has made Naomi bitter? Who has brought her back empty? Whose fault is all of this? All right, so buckle your seatbelts. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to teach you the secret of the life, universe, and everything, and we will all have a firm grasp on how God think, can be good and there be bad things in the world. You ready? And yeah. So that's a hopeless, hopeless undertaking to do in, in 10 minutes, let alone a lifetime to understand. The Bible has a lot to say about how God can, can be good and there be bad things. But nowhere, not a single place, is a definitive answer given to that question. There's no answer, or perhaps better yet, God answers the question in a different way than we want it answered. See, when we pose the question, why does bad things happen to good people, or why do bad things happen in the lives of those who are following God, we crave a simple and clear explanation. This reason, this reason, ergo this. That's not what God gives. God doesn't give a simple and clear answer. He gives himself. The greatest answer to this question of how there can be bad things in a world created and ruled by a good God is Jesus Christ on the cross. And we need to remember as we wrestle with the bitterness of life that God's answer is to point us to Jesus, God with us, who has drank the cup of bitterness to the dregs. It's not necessarily the simple, clear answer that we want in the midst of the difficulty of life, but that's the answer that God gives us. But our text does press us into considering this question. Because Naomi is specific here. She's not saying there's bad things in life, so I got my share. No, nope, she's saying God brought me out. I went out full and God brought me back empty. God's hand is against me. So here's what she says in, in verse 13. We remember from last week. She says, No, my daughters, for it is far more bitter to me than to you, for the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Or again, from today in verses 20 and 21, she says, You should not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has caused me to be very bitter. I went away full, but Yahweh, that is God, brought me back empty-handed. Why call me Naomi? When Yahweh has testified against me, and Shaddai, or the Almighty, has brought calamity upon me. Why call me Naomi? In short, Naomi says, God, this is your fault. Call me bitter because that describes the life that God has given me. And, and the names she uses as she gives this, this proclamation are significant. They're significant names for who God is. So in your translation, you probably see the, the word Lord, all in capitals. That's how we usually write in English Bibles, Yahweh. The, we don't really know how the name is pronounced, but 
the, the covenant name of God. It's the, the association of, of the God who is the covenant partner of his people. And then again, she says, Shaddai. This was probably translated as Almighty in the translation. Shaddai. This is the, a name of God associated with God as the ruler and judge of the universe, the God who gives blessings and the God who gives curses, the God who judges, the God who redeems. So she's, in pointing to this, she's saying, God, you who are the covenant God, you who are the ruler who gives people blessings and curses, you've given me a bad life, a, a bad shake, as it were. Naomi is emphatically saying her lot in life is due to God. Bitterness is the result of God's plan and purpose in her life. God is the judge, the jury, and the adversary in the legal case against Naomi, and that's why she's got what she's got. So the question for us to think about is, is Naomi right? Is she right? Is her life bitter because of God? this is not an isolated teaching in scripture by any measure and we could spend a great deal of time working through similar things to what Naomi has just said here throughout scripture but I want to point us to one significant passage that does a good job for us and calls for us to in many ways abandon simplistic views of God for something far more grand Isaiah 45, 7 is an important passage about God's control. So he's in, in the context here, God is describing himself as the only God, the one who carries out his plans. And, and listen to what he says. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Okay, let me read that again. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does these things. Now, calamity could also be translated woe or even evil. It's a broad word. And to get the, the idea of the word, we'll use the very technical sounding bad stuff. bad stuff. God says here he is responsible both for good stuff and for bad stuff. And it's significant here that the Hebrew word translated create in this passage, it's used twice, talking about create. It's a word that's only ever used in the Old Testament for God creating things. So we, we use create you can create a work of art. A person can do that. Well, in, in the Hebrew Old Testament, only God creates using this word, this he particular Hebrew word. And in both cases, in this poetic line, God creates darkness and God creates calamity. That is, the stronger assertion about what God does is put on the bad stuff side of the ledger rather than the good stuff side of the ledger even darkness and bad stuff are not outside of God's creel control. And I think the reason for that is, is simple. It's easy to expect good things from a good and benevolent God. No one writes a book, why do good things happen to good people? That's the expected, well, we all expect that, but, but right, there's a famous book when bad things happen to good people, that's a question that we wrestle with. Why do bad things happen to good people? When good things happen to good people, we're all okay with that. How do we account for bad things? How do we account for the bitterness of Naomi? And I think the short answer is simply this. We don't. 
we let God account for that. It's ultimately not up to us to figure that out. We do, in our lives, cling to certain truths in hope. We cling to a God who accompanies us through the valley of the shadow of death. He doesn't say you will avoid it, but he does say he will come through you, through it, with you. We cling to a God who leads us down the paths of redemption that oftentimes travel through lands that we don't want to be in and we would rather have traveled around. Naomi here, she just displays utter honesty in the hardships of life. But note, she's actually confessing faith in God in all of this. While her life is hard, she attributes that hardness to God's mysterious plan. She's not turning from God. She's returning to God. She's back in her land. She's broken. She's in need of redemption. But where is she looking? To the God who dealt her a bitter hand, but is also the only God who can deal her anything else. She affirms here even in her complaint against God, that ultimately, God, it is up to you. You create good stuff and you create bad stuff, and it's all in your hands. She takes her stand along with Job, right? the famous case from the Old Testament, Job, and other Old Testament saints who testify this simple truth. God has done this. I don't like it. And I know that God is good, and I will follow him even when that doesn't make sense right now. And that's Naomi. We don't know if her lot in life was due to God punishing her for some sort of sin. We don't know. We're not told, and we don't really have a need to speculate. Because in a world full of hardships and tragedy, it's a really rare case that someone makes it through life without being bitter. There's lots of opportunities to end up being bitter. But as we walk in our own times of bitterness, just remember, God is okay. God is big enough for us to ask God why, for us to acknowledge, God, you are in control, and this doesn't make sense to me, and you are in control. So we need to have an understanding of God that's big enough to where it doesn't fall apart when life is bitter for us. Life is going to be bitter. There are going to be periods of bitterness. And God tells us over and over again that he is over all. And in the face of bitterness, what we see in Naomi and what we will see as the weeks go on is she keeps living her life. She understands God is in control and is waiting for God to do something different. And that's where we end in verse 22 of chapter 1. With a certain expectation that something is going to happen. And it's a pivot in the story. Next week, we'll find that it's Ruth, not Naomi, who steps into the center stage. Who is a central actor in carrying things out. They're back in the land. Naomi left because of famine, and now they're back, and there's food. While she lost much on her journey, she's back with Ruth. And the question hangs over the story of how can Ruth become a true worshiper of God and a true member of God's people? The return to the land has us on the edge of our seats as we move forward, asking what different can God do? What different will God do? And the one thing we can certainly bet on is that the God who is able to create bad stuff can also create good stuff. And it's to that that we continue to look forward to. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, you are the Almighty. You create darkness and you make the light. You create calamity, and you make order and goodness. 
And God, we often walk in lives that are full of calamity. And we see calamity around us and we taste it all too often and all too deeply. God, we pray for the strength to be hopeful and the humility to be honest before you that we don't understand. And, and there's a lot of times where we don't like what's going on in our lives. God, we pray for the hope to walk even in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death and know that you are with your people. God, give us eyes to look forward to a redemption that comes through Jesus who walked deeper into the valley of the shadow of death than any can even imagine and who knows the way through and can bring those who trust in him through it and out. God, it's in your mighty name that we pray this. Amen. Our hymn of response is on the screen. Uh, actually comes from a different hymnal. So if you would please stand, if you're able, and sing with me, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-ending still, his treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage, take the clouds you so much dread. Are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. You may be seated. Come now to the time of our service where we share any requests you would like the body to be aware of and just start off with uh, the tornado that went through Gaylord that many of us are aware of and the devastation right, and the bitterness and despair that can easily set in the hopelessness. Uh, any other requests? all that goes with graduation the season of time any any further requests all right we will 
join with me in, in prayer. God, we think of a tornado and the just mighty power as the wind destroys buildings and, and many things that we have created. And yet, Lord, we are, we are unable to tame your creation. And God, as we look at that and, and we pray for the lives that were lost, the families that are grieving, the lives that have been shattered, God, we pose that same question, Lord, of, of why and of, of what is going on, Lord, of why such things happen. And God, we pray that in our hearts and in the hearts of those who have been touched more directly, you would shine in the answer of your hope, God, that you are in control, that you are good and that your answer to it is ultimately not to explain yourself to us, but to give yourself to us. And may, Lord, your people in that area be especially equipped to show your love and your goodness in the time of struggle around the, the tornado and devastation. God, we pray for the various health concerns. Um, and Lord, they never, they never stop, Lord, for our lives are on a, on a one-way path towards death in this life. And, and God, we pray that in the midst of them, Lord, these young men, as, as well as so many others, would learn to see hope in you, even as you struggle with failing bodies, with stressful jobs, with a medical system that is difficult to navigate. And God, we do just think of the time of graduation and the excitement that it is in the lives of so many. And Lord, for all of the traveling, all of the um, greetings and partings that will be going on in the coming weeks as we celebrate this time in, in the lives of those graduating. Lord, guide them in, in the ways that you would have them go. And may those ways through many different lands and many different pathways return to you and lead towards you for the glory of your name. Lord, for it is ultimately King Jesus who we long to see glorified. And we join together now in praying in the words that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and sing with me our hymn of thanksgiving, number 363, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. We're doing verses 1 and 2.
been standing for the announcements. Uh, just to draw attention to a couple of the announcements. One, um, the membership. If you're interested in becoming a member, want to learn more, we'll be having a membership class in June 5th, which is in two weeks from now. So let me know. Um, second, I've seen here a summer reading group. So what this is, I'm going to read a significant book on issues of gender, sexuality, and culture. Okay, so this is what I'm doing, and I'm inviting anyone who wants to come along with it for the journey to come along. So if you're interested in that, there's some more details back there, or please just talk to me. And lastly, please join us in the multi-purpose room for a celebration of the graduates. Any last things to be made aware of? Receive now this benediction as we think about serving the Lord in this world. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. <laughs>